було дуже холодно. It was freezing. And I'm not talking about the weather. December, January and February, it's always cold in Crimea during this month. But it was cold emotionally. Even then we felt like there were two worlds that did not intersect and each lived with its worldview. One of them had been leaning towards Russian propaganda for years, and they just stood silently when we approached them, asking, Who are you? Where are you from? What are you doing here? For the other world, human rights, freedom, dignity, statehood and independence weren't just empty words, but something that had sense and was worth fighting for. You've just heard Elmira Ablalimova, a Crimean Tatar, activist and former head of the Bakhchisarai Historical and Cultural Reserve, who survived the occupation of Crimea by the Russians in 2014. My name is Anna Polinchuk. I'm a producer and showrunner of the podcast Why Do They Steal? In the fourth episode, we will talk about Crimean historical jewelry that has been stuck in Amsterdam due to the Russian annexation of the peninsula. This story began in the summer of 2013 with an exhibition in the German city of Bonn. It was called Crimea, the Golden Island in the Black Sea. Five museum institutions participated in its creation. Kherson-S Reserve, Kerch Reserve, Bakhchisarai Reserve, Museum of Taurus in Simferopol, and a branch of the National Museum of History of Ukraine that was called Museum of Historical Treasures of Ukraine. That material was superb. There was no such exhibition in Ukraine before. And we thought we had to show the project in Kyiv after it ended in Germany, so that Ukrainians could see what Crimean history is. In fact, Crimea is full of treasures. It had no pause in development. All the tribes and nations passed by this territory. You've heard Lyudmila Strokova, archaeologist and historian, who was the head of the Museum of Historical Treasures of Ukraine from 2004 to 2016. She's the head of the Ukrainian Folk Decorative Art Museum now. She was one of the organizers of the Crimea the Gold Island in the Black Sea exhibition. Despite Lyudmila's expectations, the exhibit was never shown in Ukraine. But we hope it's just not yet shown in Ukraine. Elmira Ablalimova will tell us more about the exhibition's pieces. The exhibition consists of over 500 pieces. The museum workers say there are about more than 2,000 storage pieces. So one exhibit can consist of several items. There are antique objects, objects from the Gothic tombs, objects of the Scythian and late Scythian eras. The value of the exhibition does not lie in the fact that it had objects made of white or yellow metal. Often in museums, a little wooden object may be more valuable than gold jewelry because it is unique and there is no such thing anywhere else in the world. And this exhibition had such objects. For example, lampshade clay vessels are unique and very beautiful. They have a neck on the back to pour the water inside. And the lamp's head is for pouring water out. There was a beautiful statue, the snake-legged goddess, from the funds of the Kerch Historical and Cultural Reserve. More than 90% of objects provided from Crimea were retrieved during archaeological excavations during the time of its independence. Do you know why this exhibition appeared? Because of the lacquered Chinese boxes of the 1st century AD from the Sarmadian tomb in Ust Alma, the Ust Alma tomb, it's in the Bakhchisarai region. Where Crimea is located and where China is, right? And was from the 1st century AD. Such lacquered boxes were found worldwide, but this one was the most Western one. You see, it shows how big this trade route was, and they were quite well preserved thanks to this varnish. It saved these two boxes. 
They could fit one into the other like a nesting doll. Crimean archaeologists then started looking for someone to restore these two lacquered boxes. They found funding for that. It was an incredible Japanese varnish master who repaired them. And when they returned from Japan after restoration, the idea of creating such an exhibition and showing a thousand years of Crimean history as an intersection of different cultures appeared. After the massive success of the exhibition in Bonn in 2013, it moved to the Dutch city of Amsterdam the following year. Revolutionary events in Ukraine, in Kyiv at Yeromaidan, which at the time had reached its climax, served as a further promotion for the exhibition. So on February 6, 2014, the show opened in the Allard Pearson Museum and was received with great enthusiasm by the visitors. Lyudmila Strokova remembers the opening day well. When the exhibition was opening, all the museum's directors came. And on the same day, before the opening, we signed additional agreements about prolonging the display until August 31, 2014. Can you imagine? On February 6th, we had a pleasant meeting with our Crimean colleagues. I had known these people for years. We had been friends, so it was lovely. I met some people for the first time, but in general we all were acquainted. Because archaeology is a united community. We had informal talks about what was going on. And there was a director who was quickly fired after the annexation of Crimea. I didn't like talking with him. We talked about what was going on in Ukraine, about the independency, Maidan. And he told me, we didn't manage before and I think we will manage now. I remembered this phrase on March 16th. When it comes to Crimea, it was and it will be Russian, Ukrainian and Crimean Tatar. But it will never be Banderite. And this strategic territory must be under a strong and stable sovereignty, which can only be Russian today. The exhibition Crimea the Gold Island in the Black Sea was successfully exhibited while Ukraine was trying to recover from the annexation of Crimea and Russia was waging war in the east of Ukraine in Donbass. The exhibition finished only in the summer of 2014 and on September 4th the exhibits from Kyiv Museum of Historical Treasures of Ukraine returned to Ukraine. But what happened to the Crimean part of the exhibition? The Allard Pearson Museum faced a dilemma, returning the exhibits to the annexed museums in Crimea or sending them to Kyiv. After all, it was the property of Ukraine. The judicious Dutch people decided that the decision would be made in court unless Russia and Ukraine could find common ground. On November 19, 2014, Crimean museums that started collaborating with the occupation authorities, filed a claim to the Amsterdam District Court and demanded to return the exhibits to the annexed Crimea. In return, Kyiv authorities filed their lawsuit for returning the valuables to the country they belonged to, Ukraine. In the Netherlands, the Ukrainian side was represented by the legal company Bert Stoop and Sanders NV. They're famous for returning and protecting cultural valuables since the Second World War. And they provide legal consultations to many Dutch museums. Says Andrei Karnaukhov, one of the leading Ukrainian lawyers in cultural heritage and intellectual property law. He is the head of the team of Ukrainian lawyers working with Burstup and Sanders Envy in this process. 
Our company, Serhii Kazakov and Partners, is one of the oldest companies created since Ukraine's independence. We launched it in 1994. That's why we have a lot of experience, and I have a background in cultural heritage protection. Furthermore, we have experience working with international law firms, including such jurisdictions as the Netherlands. We were invited to join as local Ukrainian experts in Ukrainian law. It's a matter of honor, so we agreed, and it's also a matter of reputation. And of course, we protected Ukraine. Several Ukrainian ministries formed a team and the process of returning the exhibits became a real precedent and attracted the attention of the whole world. In fact, it's the first litigation between Ukraine and Russia. It was the first litigation when Russia was deemed the aggressor state and Crimea was considered to be occupied. It's a big deal, so Russia didn't want such information to be voiced during a trial. But thanks to the Dutch media, it was published in mass media. Besides, this case revealed the true face of Russia. It's a real thimble-rig gamer. Formally, Russia isn't even a side in this process. They presented four quasi-Ukrainian museums that are legal entities within Ukrainian law, and they demanded the return of the valuables to their territory, to the occupied Crimea. Immediately after the occupation, other legal legal entities were created at the same address subordinate to the Ministry of Culture of Crimea. In other words, all these museums with the same names were created as Russian museums. But in the process, those are Ukrainian legal entities speaking against us. This is total nonsense. The state of Ukraine also participates in the process, objecting to these demands and pledging for this collection to be returned to its unoccupied territory. In this trial, Russia insists that it is not the Russian Federation litigating, but rather Crimean museums that are actually subordinated to the Ukrainian government. Russians hired the most expensive lawyers to prove the independence of the occupied museum's interests. They tried to exploit the democracy of Ukrainian law and appeal to the status of Crimea as an autonomy within Ukraine. According to the Constitution of Crimea, the Autonomous Republic may have certain assets in its ownership, but cultural values are regulated by other legislation. And we may have, for example, artistic or museum values that belong to private collections. Or it is a component of the National Museum Fund. There is a single authority that has the right to dispose of or determine its fate. This is the Ministry of Culture. The position of our opponents was based on these attempts. And they were shocked when the court of first instance applied the norm of international law and the international convention regarding the obligation to return these artifacts to the owner. After the court of first instance ruled in favor of Ukraine on December 14, 2016, the complex process continued because the Russians filed an appeal and brought Crimean Museum collaborators to the Dutch court. Ludmila Strokova recalls meeting them. Since I was the only witness of the story from the very beginning to the end, I needed to be present in case my testimony was required. I didn't want to go there because I knew the Crimean colleagues would be there. People I talked with for many years. There were three judges, the Ukrainian delegation on the right and the Crimean delegation on the left. One deputy minister didn't know them, another deputy minister didn't know them either, and I did, and we were pretending to be strangers. There must be no impromptu. So we discussed everything in advance just in case there were some questions for me. We prepared different arguments, but fortunately it didn't happen. I could have a hypertensive crisis, I could faint from stress. It was really, really tough. And Amsterdam fascinated me when I left the court. I had been there a few times, and I had no wishes at all. I couldn't see anything, and I wanted nothing. The team defending Ukrainian interests 
even had to switch a jury to achieve the result. Ukrainian lawyers found out he had connections with Russians in the past. And to change a jury in the Netherlands is a big deal. Judges and lawyers in robes who come on bicycle to the court hearing, it's exciting really. It kind of breaks the usual patterns. These extremely polite, serious, influential lawyers are coming to the court session on bicycles. It's a case with a significant ideological subtext. It made me more Ukrainian than I was before. And every one of us felt a huge responsibility. A lawyer is always responsible. But we faced a challenge created by our neighbor. We knew we didn't have the right to make a single mistake, even a tiny one. And that's it. We worked smoothly together all day long. Quite interestingly, despite all the modern technologies, people in the Netherlands place a high value on traditions. The legislation changes, and people switch from books to gadgets in court. Books are outdated because everything is constantly changing. And there our colleagues were reading laws from the 60s, 50s, from printed volumes full of bookmarks. It's very impressive. They come to the court with big suitcases and bring case materials and books about litigation and law. They're all full of bookmarks and notes made with pencils and highlighters, and they use them for argumentation. On June 10, 2023, the Supreme Court of the Netherlands announced the final decision on the Crimean gold, ruling that it must be returned to Ukraine. The Russians had no chance of winning this case. After the full-scale invasion, the Dutch lawyers, who had previously cooperated with them, have now refused to do so, as reputation is more valuable than money. Luckily, the struggle for these valuables has come to a happy end for Ukraine. Ludmila Strokova shares her thoughts. This case is a part of the cultural front line. When everything started in Donbass and Crimea, I said that every one of us has our own anti-terrorist operation. And I think that Ukraine needed at least some victory to prove it is a sovereign state. Elimira Ablalimova is speaking. Russia uses culture as a political instrument in Crimea. These days we follow a bit of what's going on. Nearly 100,000 museum exhibits are part of the Russian Museum Fund, so they officially appropriated them. The other thing we've noticed is illegal archaeological diggings in Crimea. There are a lot of them. The problem is that we cannot track how many artifacts were found and we know nothing about their fate. They ended up either in Crimean universities or in museums. Or maybe they are in Russian museums. We don't have this information. And the third thing is the so-called restorations that result in cultural objects losing authenticity. It applies to immovable monuments. This was the fourth episode of the podcast Why Do They Steal? about the tragic events of the Crimean annexation affecting even the museums and about Ukraine winning the fight for its material and immaterial heritage. We have one more episode to go. It's about the future. Not only about what Ukrainians lost, but also about how to return numerous Ukrainian history artifacts stuck in Russia, following the examples of the European and even Eastern countries. Watch Why Do They Steal on the Ukrainska Pravda YouTube channel and listen to it on Apple Podcast, Google Podcast, Spotify and other platforms. Subscribe and share it. The material was prepared with the support of the International Renaissance Foundation. Production, 435 Films, Showrunners, Korni Hrytsyuk and Anna Polinchuk, Screenwriters, Korni Hrytsyuk and Yuri Marchenko, Producer and Narrator, Anna Polinchuk, Sound Supervisor, Vasily Avtushenko, Assistant, Irina Terletska, Project Coordinator, Olena Kirichak, English Translation, Anastasia Perun, 
English Voice Over Alina Zivakova Rob Feldman Katarina Gordienko English Voice Over Recording Pavlo Melnik and Ala Shmatok